Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Burke, the executive director here at the Bethlehem Area Public Library. Thank you all for joining us for our third presentation in the Save Our Swifts series. I'm going to start us off with a, a little video that will introduce you to the topic at hand. Um, and then our presenters will join us shortly. This past summer 2020, I brought groups of people to this parking lot to witness the amazing, amazing phenomenon of thousands of chimney swifts swirling into the chimney you see behind me. At some point, just around sunset, the birds just collectively decide to start pouring into the chimney. Due to alterations in habitat and changing um, of building structures, chimneys in particular, chimney swifts have been in decline since the mid 1960s. And the most recent estimate is that they've been they've had a 72 percent decline in their overall population, providing critical migratory roosting sites like these chimneys for chimney swifts is paramount in their overall population survival. So we've got some, some people actually already getting involved. So we're here on the first day of demolition and uh, talked to the engineers last week trying to have them figure out a way to save the actual chimney in place. And you can see how easy the building's coming down. So it's going to be kind of an interesting uh, engineering challenge. Uh, if we can, we're going to save it in place. If not, we have plan B, which is actually we build a chimney about 60 feet further to the north on the other side of the parking lot. And hopefully that's the best way to get the birds back. And in the day, the biggest goal we have here is just to save something so these birds have the ability to uh, do roots when they're migrating. And in doing so, we're trying to save thousands, probably tens of thousands of swifts, a whole generation of swifts. So we invite you to join, to join this amazing effort to save these amazing birds. Thanks again for joining us. This is Josh Burke from the Bethlehem Mary Public Library. I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Brina Holland of Lehigh University. Those of you who are watching us on YouTube, you can leave your questions and comments for the presenters right there in the chat box in YouTube, and we will share them with our presenters, and you will have your questions answered. So let's turn it over to Brina. Hi, Brina. Hi, Josh. Thanks so much. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us tonight for this panel on the Swift Birds of Bethlehem. Our panel is titled Modeling a Solution of Cooperation Between Conservation and Development. My name is Brina Holland. I'm an associate professor at Lehigh University in the Department of Political Science and the Environmental Initiative. And I'm excited to be here tonight moderating um, this discussion with a truly wonderful group of panelists. Before I introduce them to you all, I want to thank the um, sponsors of tonight's panel. Funding for this event was provided by the Lehigh Valley Engaged Humanities Consortium. We're grateful for their support of these important conversations about the swift birds of Bethlehem. <clears throat> We're also grateful to the Bethlehem Area Public Library for hosting this event and to Josh Burke in particular, who managed all of the technology and has done so much to advance this conversation about the swift birds locally. The Bethlehem Public Library's programmers have been once wonderfully successful in producing events like this one that allow community members to come together and talk about issues that matter to the citizens of Bethlehem, despite the challenging this poses, challenges this poses under the current pandemic conditions. 
I also want to thank the Lehigh Valley Audubon Society for all the work that they've done to save our Swifts on the Save Our Swifts project. Uh, tonight, we're lucky to have both Scott Burnett and Peter Sanger on our panel. With our local Audubon Society, these two people have done so much to lead the way in thinking about how residents might better support bird species in our region. Our thanks also go to Artifact Incorporated, whose founder, Christine Usler, has given this project, and I'll add many other efforts to protect what's wonderful in the city of Bethlehem, so much of her time. Of course, this enormous, an enormous thanks must also go to Jenny Gilrain, whose vision, energy, and inspiration pulled all of these organizations together in a community-wide effort to save the swift birds of Bethlehem and to imagine what it would mean to share our city with them. Our panel tonight is the third public conversation that we've had about the swift birds and what we are doing and what we can do to protect them in the city. As many of you heard in, as many as you may have heard in the vibrant conversations that many among us are already having, the local effort to save our swifts began when Jenny Gilrain saw them spiraling into the chimney at the former Masonic temple. The sheer number of these birds, which I hope you just noticed in the video, there were many of them, um, the sheer number of them engaged in flight maneuvers of extreme aerobatic agility is breathtaking and enthralling. And it drew Jenny and many others to learn more about the birds' migration, about their habitat, and the importance of the chimneys in Bethlehem to their survival. These resourceful birds have been using the chimneys to survive in the wake of urban infringement and massive deforestation during a time when birds in North America have fallen into precipitous decline. For example, since 1970, the number of birds in the US has fallen by 29%. The desire of Jenny and other residents to support the Swifts put them in conversation with developer John Noble and his family, who were preparing to demolish the Masonic temple that contained the chimney used by the Swifts. The demolition was part of a long and carefully planned development project that also includes preservation of the historic Wilbur Mansion that is next to the temple. Together, Jenny, John Noble, and a number of community leaders began to imagine ways of preserving this massive chimney that provides a home to thousands of birds on their annual migratory journey. And so with the support of some of our panelists here tonight and others in the Save Our Swifts team, Mr. Noble devised a plan to take the temple down around the chimney so the chimney could remain intact as a home for the birds who use it when they're returning from Central and South America. If you look at these pictures, you'll see that the exacting task of this demolition project is worthy of the swift bird's aerobatic precision. But it was also a costly endeavor, as you can imagine when you look at the pictures. So if you can afford to make a donation to the project, please do so at the Save Our Swifts GoFundMe page. That video that you just saw was there, is located there as well. While the Save Our Swifts team was initially consumed in the important task of saving the Masonic Temple chimney, we are here tonight to also think more broadly about how we can support the Swifts and live more compatibly with them and other declining and threatened species with whom we share our local environment and indeed the whole planet. The Swift team has already been successful in working with local officials to get the Swift bird named as the official bird of Bethlehem. These previous efforts demonstrate that here in Bethlehem, we are already, as the title of the panel suggests, suggests modeling a solution of cooperation between conservation and development. As we take up discussion of the Swiss tonight, we are positioned to not just recognize what has been accomplished already, but also to imagine what our relationships to the Swiss should be going forward. To imagine what it means for a city to befriend a bird and to make a commitment to its ongoing presence and thriving here in the city as it lives with and among us for part of its life. <clears throat> We are lucky tonight to have a truly wonderful group of panelists to initiate the conversation, and I'd like to introduce them to you all now. First, but first person who's going to speak tonight is um, developer and property owner of the Masonic Temple in Wilbur Mansion, John Noble. Mr. Noble is going to tell the story of his commitment to conservation, his discovery of the birds in the Masonic Temple chimney in South Bethlehem, and his decision to save the birds by saving an important part of their migratory habitat. And he will talk a bit about the impact of this decision on his development project. It's great to have Mr. Noble here. Thank you for coming and also for the work you've been doing with these birds. 
Peter Sanger um, is our second panelist, is an endowed professor, professor of ornithology in the Department of Biology at Muhlenberg College. He manages the Bird Museum within the Ecopian Center for Ornithology, has been the president of the Lehigh Valley, Valley Audubon Society for the last 16 years, and currently serves as the membership chair of the Wilson Ornitholo Orth Ornithological Society. These are challenging words, some of them. Scott Burnett is the chair of the Habitat Committee at the Lehigh Valley Audubon Society. Um, he's here also with us tonight, as I mentioned, and has been the person leading the charge to build chimney swift towers in Lehigh Valley, in the Lehigh Valley for years. So we'll get to hear more about that from him as well. Mr. Burnett has assisted with other Audubon chapters and organizations um, in constructing chimney swift towers, such as the Wissahickon Audubon, the Wincott, Wincott Audubon, the Delaware Valley Ornithological Club, the New Jersey Audubon, and also many Eagle Scouts. We also have Lynn Rothman here, who is an environmental scientist and chair of the Bethlehem Environmental Advisory Council. Ms. Rothman previously worked for the Environmental Protection Agency on wetland protection. So she has some experience uh, balancing environmental protection with development and property rights. Lynn currently serves on the chair of, serves on the board of the Sustainable Energy, Energy Fund and if you know her, you will, you will know that she is also a powerful force behind all the good things in Bethlehem um, government that are happening related to the environment. Dr. Karen Beck Pooley, our next panelist, is a professor of practice in the Department of Political Science and the Environmental Initiative at Lehigh University, where she also directs the Environmental Policy Program. Dr. Pooley teaches courses on planning, neighborhood, and housing issues, and she also serves as a senior associate at CZB LLC, which is an urban planning and neighborhood de <clears throat> development consulting firm. She, is the <clears throat> she was the executive director of the Redevelopment Authority of the City of Allentown from 2007 to 2011, and prior to that was the dep deputy director within New York City's Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, and also a research associate at the Institute for Children and po Poverty. Last, we are delighted to have here tonight, Ms. Emma Huertas. She is a fourth grade student at Freemansburg Elementary School. She is one of the students who wrote letters to Bethlehem City Council and the mayor to advocate for naming the chimney swift the official bird of Bethlehem. And she also spoke at the February 2nd City Council meeting and read her letter aloud. Emma is a true leader for protection of the SWIFT. And finally, I'm Brina Holland. As I said, I'm also a faculty member at Lehigh University in the Department of Political Science and the Environmental Initiative. And my job here is to get the conversation going among our panelists before opening up for a broader conversation with the audience. What I'm planning to do is give each of them five minutes <clears throat> to talk about their perspective on this project that's going on with the SWIFTS locally um, and to answer a couple of particular questions. Um, so we'll hear a bit from them before I invite those of you in the audience to engage with us tonight and to imagine a future for the SIFs, for the SWIFTS in our city. We hope that you can help us think about what it me might mean for a city to protect, befriend a bird how the symbolic gesture of naming the chimney swift, the bird of Bethlehem, might impact our relationship to the species, how we might implement policy changes that reflect this changing relationship, and how the story might encourage a citywide <clears throat> attitude of respect for wildlife more general and our changing relationship with the earth. So with that, I would like to turn first to Mr. Noble. Thank you again for being with us. Um, we're very excited to hear about your plans for the chimney tower um, that you saved at the former Masonic Temple. And we wonder if you might start by telling us a bit more about um, what you're doing at the site and in particular, the development of the site, um, where it stands now and what the timeline is for reconstructing whatever it is you plan to reconstruct around that chimney. Uh, thanks, Brina, for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, just to give everyone a, a little background uh, on myself and, and the project, um, I personally have always thought that conservation and basically nature was a part of any element you do in life. So it's anything I've tried to do, I've actually tried to create balances so I didn't impact surrounding 
neighbors, nature, and everything else. Uh, with the Masonic Temple, uh, five years ago, I actually, I bought this project without totally understanding what I was going to do with it. Uh, and it's and it's been a kind of a morphing four and a half years of, of understanding the best way to, to do it. Um, that being said, though, one of the, one of the things that I, I've always strived to do, and, and with this property was really important too. No, no matter what I did, uh, you ultimately had to improve how it impacted the community, the neighbors, and nature in, in in its use. Right now, uh, when I bought the property, there was there was almost there was a, a minimal amount of trees and shrubberies. So when we get done with this project, it's actually going to be a lot more harmonious with how nature, birds, and and wildlife and, and people can live in that area. So, you know, as a developer, I think it's it's always important to not only create different structures and uses, but to also create a better environment for the neighbors and nature. It's, it's, a, it's a big balance and you have to do it. Um, with this project, I, I kind of got a bonus. So um, we, we've already had, uh, we, we already were focused heavily on landscaping and trying to bring in a lot more trees. We were, we're gonna actually bring in the better part of uh, 100% of, of the trees that went down. We're gonna probably double that at, at this point. So we're gonna make the environment a lot more natural. Um, and then as, as we got into the actual demolition, um, along comes a neighbor and, uh, and it kind of enlightens me a little bit to what's going on with the property, with the building actually. You know, I already, I already had a vision for the property and how we make it better. But when it got down to something like a chimney, I, I kind of overlooked that as a, an old brick thing that was just sitting there and, and didn't fit into what I was, was ultimately doing. So with, with, with the phone call I got from Jenny, it was, it was pure enlightenment. It was kind of a fun phone call because when she, she called me, she also sent over the video of these literally thousands of birds spiraling into this chimney. And, and all of a sudden the project not only became something that was gonna really benefit the community and, and be fun to do, it also became like almost like a little passion. How, how do we do something that that probably most people wouldn't think to do, which is to save these birds. It, it, it became fun. It really did. Uh, it, not that it wasn't fun to begin with, but it became that much more fun, to be honest with you. Um, and for probably two weeks after that phone call, I learned more about swift birds and chimneys than, than I could have ever imagined in my lifetime. Um, the ultimate outcome of this thing was we, we kind of created awareness in the entire town, in the community, uh, my own personal awareness, and, and it became a, a real challenge. How do we save this chimney and save this habitat so that these birds are actually have a good probability of using it? And that's, that's where we're at right now. The, um, we had two choices. One was to save the chimney and one was to replace it with something else. Ultimately, the save the chimney is the best choice. So that's where we focus all of our efforts on. Uh, and when we did that, we got extremely lucky in that a majority of of the footprint was out of our development area and in a space that was between our new building and our parking lots. So when, when we get done right now, we've actually saved the structure, but we've also totally redesigned our building to be able to accept the load of this chimney so that when we're done, we're going to have the brand new building that we wanted to have events, a new restaurant, small hotel, and we're going to have this chimney as literally a focal point of that, that building and the surrounding environment. So it's, it's kind of like one of those big time bonuses that everything fit together. When you, when you come in and you drive on our site, probably the first thing you're gonna see is a big chimney. So it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be pretty cool. Um, a, a little sidebar here on, on the GoFundMe site. Uh, this is one of these things that, that I personally has a passion for. So the GoFundMe site, I think at this point is, is one of those things that we're gonna be best used for education uh, we've also talked about putting cameras in the chimney so people can really see in real time what's going on. So from a, from a future standpoint, everything that we do on this, on this GoFundMe is going to be purely earmarked for, for education and actually taking and putting internal cameras. This is, a, this is kind of a, a project that both uh, me and my family are, are just so excited to do that it's, it's irrelevant of the cost. And the effort, it's, it's that much, it's that fun, okay? Everyone in my family is, is really excited about it. And we're going to make sure that we, you know, not only do it right, but we, we educate the entire community on what's going on there.
That's great. Thank you so much. And um, while we're talking, John, just really quickly about the, the site, um, is there any recommendation you can make for where people can go to see the Swifts going into the chimney later in the year so they're not trespassing? Um. <laughs> well, right now the site's totally fenced off, so it's, okay. it's, it's tough to trespass. Cherokee Streets actually, from an elevation standpoint, is, is almost at the height of the, of the chimney itself. So the, the views are gonna be great along Cherokee Street. Uh, we're hoping that once we get the building significantly done and we get the, uh, all of the utilities in there and all the mechanicals, we'll be able to actually hopefully live stream toward the, uh, toward the fall on the migration of these birds. Great, thanks for that information. Okay, can I can I chime in on that too? Because I've been scoping out a spot for for watching. <laughs> so there's also across from the um, the development site on Brighton, there's an old railroad building with a pretty wide sidewalk that I plan to park myself on to watch the Swiss coming. <laughs> I mean, it's not trespassing because it's a sidewalk. It's not trespassing on the um, on the railroad apartments. Just just a thought. <laughs> Okay, Thank great. You. Thanks for that that information. And hopefully there will be uh, lots of people out there. And so it'll be sort of obvious once the, the right desk comes along. <clears throat> Let's go ahead next to our second panelist, um, Mr. Peter Sanger. And um, it's my understanding that you've been in the business of protecting birds for a long time. Um, and I'm wondering if you can provide a perspective on this somewhat unlikely alliance between developers and conservationists. I'm, I'm assuming it's not that usual, but um, I'd like to hear that from you. Is, is, it, is it usual to have a developer engage in this way? Um, extremely unusual and almost unheard of in my opinion. And what John just did for conservation and education really um i hate to say it almost made me cry um because it is that unusual as the president of the lehigh valley audubon society and actually it's probably 17 maybe even 18 years now because the bios hold <laughs> time goes on um i've been approached by probably dozens of organizations and individuals trying to save heron rookeries, bald eagle nests, wetlands, um, mature forest that's being harvested for wood for profit, not for conservation. And in almost, and actually probably really 99% of the cases when I'm approached, we end in failure because the plans are already set in motion. And once, uh, do any type of development or um, uh, habitat change is approved by a local organization, nobody's willing to change their plans for wildlife. Mm -hmm. So when Jenny approached me about this, I was like, okay, yeah. uh, another waste of my time, but you have to try. So I volunteered Scott, our habitat chair, to go out and meet with Jenny and John Noble. And I'm thinking, I'm like so many other places, it's a waste of time. And when they came back with positive news, I almost fell off my chair. So John is probably less than 1% of developers that you'll ever run into. He's golden and um, so unique, it's incredible. So, I mean, hats off to John and his family. I mean, and what he just said now gave me some more insight to his personal thinking and stuff. And if we could only get even half the developers to have a tenth of his spirit, this world would be so much better. So, no, um, incredible and shocking and wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I, we're going to go continue going through the rest of the, the panelists, but one thing that I hope to come back to with both of you to think about in the meantime is sort of what we can do to try to get ahead of this process um, with other developers in the city. Um, you sound a little bit defeated on that, Mr. Sanger, but <laughs> maybe you both 
to put your head together and uh, put your heads together and figure out if there are some strategies to do more of this in the future that might help. Um, so think well, about that. <laughs> well, let me just add that the key there is to education, as uh, John said, that he didn't know Chimney Swift used the, the uh, chimney. So the first thing is education and then trying to get some um, empathy for our birds and our wildlife. So if yes. I can just say, say one thing. Yeah. Um, so one of, one of the things that Jenny did, which was, was really smart, is she, she approached me for conversation. And, and like Pete said, basically education, okay? Because uh, no one really responds well to, you know, threats of, of sorts. Instead, when you, you open a, a dialogue and a conversation and you explain impacts, then it kind of becomes more personal. Mm -hmm. And, and you, I could instantly see the benefit of saving this. I, I didn't know it was gonna snowball into quite what it snowballed into. Mm -hmm. I, I was a little bit more focused on literally, you know, tens of thousands of birds. I, I didn't know that, you know, Bethlehem was gonna embrace the, the swift as, as it has. But it's, you get, it starts with, with a very calm conversation. Mm -hmm. Not not a, uh, a boisterous, threatening conversation. And some good visuals, it sounds like, too. That helped. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so we'll, when we get to um, conversation with Lynn as well later, I think it'll be really helpful to maybe think about um, sort of institutionally what might be done to foster the conversation and the education, because maybe there are some things that um, government entities can do as well. But um before we get to Lynn, let's go um, first to our next panelist, Mr. Scott Burnett, who is um, a bit of an expert on these birds and let him tell us a little bit about the swifts and what makes them such special animals. I'm gonna go ahead, Scott. Um, you're, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Brina. Um, so I've got about five minutes to make you out there in the audience fall in love with chimney swifts. That's an easy one. Uh, the chimney swifts give me a big leg up with that one. They, they, they sell themselves. Um, the chimney swift, what is it? Um, a, a small uh, bird, about four inches long with an 11 inch wingspan, very curved, thin wings, kind of like a fighter jet. It's very acrobatic. Uh, aeronautic in flight, can turn on a dime, flies very fast. Uh, they're neotropical migrants, meaning that they're New World birds, um, South America and North America, and they spend their winters, the cold months, in the tropics. They come north here just for breeding, uh, and then they return to their actual home, which is in the tropics. The reason they come north for breeding is because every spring we have a incredible um, flush of insects hatching here, uh, more so even than in the tropics, which is more of a, a smooth year round flow of insects where we here in the US, uh, the northern parts of their realm, um, we get a huge influx of insect food for them, which is, makes them able to provide high protein meal for their, their chicks. Uh, and raise a good family, a healthy family each year. Um, uh, the birds, the birds um, spend the winter months, like I said, in uh, northwestern South America, from Central America down into Peru, Bolivia, uh, Colombia, um, and then around this time, uh, the end of April, uh, they begin their uh, migration north, and they are arriving here as we speak. Uh, I notified Jenny uh, the other day that uh, we've had reports of swifts in the uh, valley, and she went right outside, and sure enough, she saw some swifts right away. Now, when the swifts come here to the Lehigh Valley or to their uh, haunts in the U.S. and Canada, um, they're east of the Rocky Mountains only. There's three other species of swifts that are west of the Rocky Mountains. So this is our only swift we have here. And they come around the end of April, as I said, and they immediately go to nest. By May, they should be already building a nest and then laying eggs. Um, 
they historically nested and roosted in hollow trees um, for millennia. And when the European settlers came to the continent, uh, they cut all the old big hollow trees down for firewood and for safety reasons. Nobody wanted a hollow tree falling on their cabin. So the, the big old giant sycamores that were hollowed out that the Swifts had used for generations went down and disappeared. And the Swifts did the only thing that they could do, the only thing they knew how to do, and that was move into a reasonable facsimile for such a hollow tree. And that turned out to be uh, chimneys uh, made by humans, which were just starting to come up all over the, the uh, landscape as the building boom started as the country was settled by Europeans. So it was timely that these chimneys appeared and gave the Swifts a home. They've been using that ever since. They've actually adapted very well to chimney use and they're pretty much considered urban birds now. Where there are more chimneys, there are more Swifts. Um, so uh, one thing I will note is these are birds that use masonry chimneys only. Uh, they cannot perch or cling to smooth surfaces, even though they have very long claws. Uh, like metal flued chimneys and the newer types of construction methods serve them no purpose. Um, so the old masonry chimneys are their preference and John's got one of those and we need to keep it. Um, Jenny's seen 1,500 to 2,000 Swifts a night go into this chimney. This crop of Swifts changes daily or every couple of days as they come through their migration route south uh, and they gather in huge numbers in the fall uh, as they communally roost um, before they head for South America. So the Swifts that you see in that chimney say on an, a night in August, the end of August, would be different birds than you see later in September. So extrapolating that, you know, from thousands of birds each night and knowing that they're different birds each night, we can estimate that there are tens of thousands of birds using this chimney uh, during a migration period in the fall. Uh, they nest in the same chimneys uh, in the spring when they get here, but they're very territorial when they nest and only maybe one or two pairs will use a chimney like this. Uh, which makes their population growth a little slow because there are not enough chimneys and hollow trees and such to go around that every pair gets to breed, um, especially younger pairs. And with a 72% decline in their population since the 1960s, that means three out of four nests die before they reach breeding age. And that's a shame. Um, this bird I said has given me a big leg up to, uh, make you like it or love it. And that is these birds spend all day on the wing. They cannot perch, they cannot sit on a flat surface. Their feet are anatomically improper for that. They cannot perch a twig or sit on a flat uh, road, road surface or, or the ground. Um, they must be in flight all the time, all day, uh, unless they're clinging to a vertical surface like the inside of a chimney. So, First thing in the morning, they exit the chimney, they go on the wing hunting, they drink on the wing, uh, and their diet is predominantly uh, flying pest insects. These birds can eat a thousand mosquitoes or more a day. They eat all kinds of pest insects, beetles, moths, uh, mosquitoes, etc. So they're really beneficial, um, you know, and, uh, they're, they're our neighbors. They live in our homes. They live in our, our businesses. Um, we should welcome them as friends. And every time a chimney gets capped or torn down, we lose a population of Swifts perhaps that took generations to, to build itself to that level. So the Swift is really worth the effort to conserve. And I will talk more about that uh, during my question segment. But uh, if you have more questions about the Swifts, I'll try and answer them uh, later in the program. And or I have a uh, talk coming up uh, through the Audubon Society on May 7th, which will focus on various aspects of the Swift that we can't get into the detail of here tonight. So uh, just keep tuned in tonight and uh, we'll let you know more about that program later on. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Wonderful information.
feel like every time I go to one of these panels, I, I learn so much more. Um, so yes, we'll probably get back to some of that, more information about the SWIFTs. Um, let's for now turn to our next panelist, which is um, Lynn Rothman. And as I mentioned previously, she is the president of the Environmental Advisory Council for the city of Bethlehem. And this um, body, this governmental entity has really blossomed and, and started to do a lot locally under her leadership. So I'm thinking she might have some ideas about what can be done to protect the SWIFT. And so um, I would like you to reflect on that and or um, perhaps anything that you are planning to, hear, to do for the birds in the immediate future, I'm sure people would love to hear about. And thank you very much, Brina. So first, uh, what is an Environmental Advisory Council or as it's usually referred to by its acronym, an EAC? So EACs are officially created arms of Pennsylvania's municipal governments and they consist of three to seven members and act as advisors to the governing boards that appoint them giving the municipal governments a pool of local talent to draw upon when they make environment when they make decisions affecting the environment. So an EAC um, may develop policy proposals, research issues, execute projects, and make recommendations regarding land use, sustainability, and renew renewable energy. And an EAC also serves in an educational role to both the city and the public. So our EAC has proposed ordinances to city council and made recommendations on proposed developments to both the city and the planning commission. Now tools that governments can use to balance the impact of development with environmental protection and human health include zoning ordinances, building codes, land use plans, master plans, and landscaping requirements. And ordinances and plans place restric restrictions and requirements on development for environmental protection However, they can also be used to remove impediments, streamline, and even incentivize measures that will have a positive impact on the environment. So I believe, as actually John mentioned before, that the key elements to balancing development with environmental protection include cooperation, education, and participation among the government, developers, and the public. So when there's a good working relationship, the parties join together in the beginning stages of a project and evaluate and educate one another about the potential impacts and including impacts on traffic, air quality, waterways, wildlife, floodplains, and greenhouse gas emissions, just to name a few. So this then gives a starting point to consider design alternatives and mitigation measures in order to come up with the most sustainably viable project benefiting both the developer and the public. So most recently, our EAC has been working to support Bethlehem City's Climate Action Plan, which was just released on April 12th and can be found on the city's website. It identifies goals for sustainability, resilience, and environmental justice, and then presents strategies to incorporate and infuse these goals into future ordinances, plans, and development. So for example, in relation to development, it contains strategies for green building design, stormwater control, increased tree canopy and walkability in Bethlehem. So the creation of the Climate Action Plan included public participation and its implementation will require continued outreach and education in order to achieve its goals. And likewise, in order for these strategies to become part of development projects, developers need to understand not only how reducing greenhouse gas emissions will improve the environment, but how it will benefit them. So new construction provides opportunities to use energy saving strategies that will lower energy costs while at the same time reduce pollution. So for example, energy efficiency measures such as passive solar design features, high efficiency HVAC equipment and green roofs as well as solar panels will lower utility bills and make a building more comfortable for residents and workers. And and in addition, developers could be made aware of financing options for solar and energy efficiency projects through programs like the Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy, or CPACE for short, that attaches the financing to the property instead of to the owner. And this can free up developers' finances by placing the assessment on the property and structuring repayment through the property taxes. So Mr. Noble's preservation of the chimney is a wonderful example of balancing development with environmental protection. 
So Jenny Gilrain, a resident, understood that the proposed development would result in the loss of habitat for the swifts. She then reached out to city council, the public, and the developer. She educated all of us about the plight of the swifts. And in the spirit of cooperation, the developer listened and to his immense credit, decided to take action. The public participated and showed good faith by contributing funds for future projects related to the SWIFTS. The success of this project does not end there. Not only is Mr. Noble now an example to other developers, through education and public participation at city council meetings, the SWIFT was named the City Bird of Bethlehem, improving its visibility. There's also a movement to create more towers throughout the city, and we have this forum series. Thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of the EAC this evening. We meet the first Thursday of the month at 7 p.m. and encourage you to join us. More information can be found on our website and Facebook page, and I'll put both, both links in the chat. We welcome volunteers and would be interested in partnering or giving guidance on a project that you'd like to undertake. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, for that invitation. I want to encourage people who are interested in this to take you up on that. Um, it's just the, the EAC is a great institutional body to organize around and to, to keep the ideas generating and flowing about what we can do to save these birds um, in dialogue with local government. So um, thank you. And let's turn now to our next panelist, which is Dr. Karen Beth Pooley. Um, so as I mentioned previously, she has a distinct perspective on urban and neighborhood planning um, and has probably, I'm hoping, been uh, keeping a little bit of an eye on how this effort to protect the bird has been developing in the city. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about the potential for urban areas to do this kind of habitat protection and uh, how you potentially see this evolving over time in a, in a good way. Sure, thank you. And I will talk fast because I know everybody wants to hear from Emma. Um, but uh, <laughs> one thing um, to keep in mind, and this goes back to some of the comments that you heard from um, John Noble at the beginning is just sort of how we think about cities or any of our built environment connecting to the natural one. That, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we conceived of the environment and nature sort of off like a two or three hour drive outside of cities. And one of the really impressive shifts in just our thinking and understanding has been around how much nature is within our cities and how much our nature, our, our cities reflect sort of the, the natural elements that surround us. Rivers dictate where cities went and they dictate in many ways the way in which our cities grow. And so the fact that we're thinking about cities as sitting in the midst of nature and na natural elements and animal habitats throughout our cities is shifting the, the, the dialogue around how it is our built environment coexists with the natural one. Um, and the other really interesting shift that I've seen in planning, which I think lends itself really well to this, is this shift from really big projects really big um, development or big park projects to thinking more incrementally and even on smaller scales and testing as you go along. Um, and what cities around the country have found is that in some cases it doesn't take a lot of space. It takes a chimney and you <laughs> can create a really important habitat that wasn't clearing acres and acres of land and setting it aside. That was working in some really important conservation efforts in ways that, that if only you know, embellish the way John was talking about the, the plans for that site, conservation on the site and in the midst of the buildings that are gonna go on there, it, one only reinforces the other. And so the fact that we're thinking of these two things as they coexist and we're thinking not just in huge terms, but how there's you know, really a lot of power in small places. Um, you know, other cities have found that even thinking on those small scales and taking advantage of small places can have an incredible impact on urban biodiversity and not only making people happier in those places, but making more room and, and you know, more space for um, animals in, in cities, um, like the birds that we're talking about. Um, one thing that I also heard a lot about, you know, as the different speakers were, were talking was, you know, the importance as you think about this relationship between nature and the built environment, um, being proactive in the way those things continue to coexist, because each is going to evolve. Nothing ever stays the same, but how it is they, co they evolve uh, together, you know, better outcomes come from being proactive rather than reactive. 
Um, and all of the tools that Lynn was describing that the EAC is shepherding um, in our city sort of can be put to really constructive ends if there's a guiding goal and big picture like this group has laid out here for you know, thinking about the SWIFTs and creating more space and more habitats for the SWIFTs throughout the city. That then can sort of direct policymakers, that can direct residents, sort of all in the same direction and make us ready to take advantage of opportunities as they exist and, and um, pop up in order to create more space for the birds. Um, so just all of those things, both how nature and cities, you know, we increasingly see them coexisting, how we're empowered to sort of do lots on a small scale and think incrementally and test um, and how we can be proactive in our policies around creating those kinds of spaces. This is sort of an example of how powerful all of those things are when you put them together. Um, and they fit right in with the increased role that cities overall are playing in thinking about environmental conservation and thinking about reacting to climate change. Um, so it really is coming at a moment where you know, cities are increasingly equipped and geared up to, to tackle these kinds of challenges. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, so um, let's go ahead before we open it up for more questions for you and others. Um, on to Ms. Emma Huertas. And we have to, Emma, do you know how to undo the mute there? on your screen. Okay, great, thank you. So Emma, many of us have been inspired by your efforts to get these birds protected. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more tonight about what your vision is for the Swifts in the city. You are our future. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emma Huertas, and I am a fourth grader at Pumasburg Elementary School. I would like to ask everyone who is listening to protect the chimney swifts. This is why. One, they are insectivores, so they only eat insects, like flies, ladybugs, and any other insects. They even eat mosquitoes. A swift eats 2,000 insects in one day. So the 2,200 swifts that live in the Masonic Temple chimney all together eat 4 million 400,000 insects in one day. Isn't that cool? Yeah, but that's not all. Keep listening. Two, swifts have been in our city's history since the 1800s. Three, swifts may not have a whole lot of color, but the way they move to go into the chimney is beautiful. I feel like when the chimney swifts are flying, it's like a princess is dancing in a barn because it is super dainty and elegant. Please listen to me and hear why these birds are so important to me and my classmates. The reason is that to us, they're not just birds. They're like family. If these birds were people, you would make sure they had a home. So give these birds a home and protect them from home. My, my vision for the swifts is this. Stop demolishing big old chimneys that have swifts in them. Sa save the chimney swifts homes. Stop capping chimneys. Build chimney swift towers on big pieces of land all over. Maybe the first tower could be near my house. We should build a tower on our school property because then in science class, we can look out the window and see the swifts going into the tower. We can see the swifts flying with the twigs in their mouth and going into the chimney. We could watch them use this bit to make their nests. That would be cool because we can see how they make their nests and why it's important to help them. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Emma. That was really great. Wonderful to hear. You've already started to reimagine our relationship to the environment and have proposed some ideas there for what this can do to change our city and change the way we think about birds. So thanks very much. Um, so that takes us through our introduction to this wonderful panel. And I wanna open it up now for the audience to ask our panelists questions. I don't know, have you received any questions so far, um, Josh? Yes, I have. And Great. one of them, I think I know the answer for, but they were asking <laughs> Scott, there's any chance we could get the Swifts to eat lantern flies? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they eat them, do they? They're too big. The flies. It's, I mean. inter it's an interesting question. Um, 
we really, I don't think, know the answer to that yet. Uh, they only eat um, insects in flight. They catch them on the wing, swoop around with their little mouth open, and they swoop right onto the insect and, and uh, swallow it down. Uh, a lantern fly doesn't really fly that far from point to point, so it might not be uh, avail that available as a food source to chimney swifts, and it's a little big. Uh, these birds are quite small. Uh, it might be uh, more of a meal than they'd want to tackle, but we can hope. Yes, that's what I thought. Thinking about the size of those flies and the size yeah. of those birds, that, that's a tough match. Um, we had a couple questions for Mr. Noble. Um, the, the first one was, if, if there's a sort of larger environmental plan for the site and if there's plans to use uh, native uh, trees and native plants in the landscaping around the site, uh, if, that's, if that's part of the bigger picture. Yeah, so the simple answer is yes. Um, we hired a Brown Design Group out of Allentown, uh, Chris Brown, to do all the landscape ar architecture work for the site. And he's, he's very big. He's, he's, I believe, part of, of Allentown's uh, tree conservation uh, group. Uh, and he's literally transformed the, the site. The, uh, Technically, we're required to, to do, use about 100 native trees. Right now, we're, we're going to plant back about 150. Uh, and then on top of that, we've got a lot of ground covering, a lot of shrubbery. Uh, we're basically going to green up the site to a level that's probably close to 160, 170% of what's technically required. You know, in, in my book, it's not necessarily what's required, but it's how do you soften a site? How do you make it environmentally friendly? How do you try to bring some of the wildlife life back? So that's that's a goal. And, and yes, we've got Chris Brown doing a great job with that. We just had a meeting today with the uh, County Conservation District on that. That's great. Thank you. One of our other questions from the audience was, I'll just read it word for word here. It says, I know the original plan was to build a new chimney. Um, and Anissa, is wondering if Mr. Noble here, if you can talk more about the step-by-step -step process of excavating the old chimney and decide, deciding to save it instead. So is that correct? That was the original plan, and then how'd that how that turn that way? The, well, there was there was no plan per se. It was it was the first couple of weeks after talking to uh, to Scott and Jenny. It was exploring what we could do, uh, and some of, some of it is a big structural element. You know, is this is this 50 foot tall structure gonna be able to actually stand basically kind of on its own while we do all sorts of work around it? Um, and, and literally after I did the research and talking to everyone about Swifts and, and some of the chimneys that have been put up uh, outside the area, cause I've called all over the country, uh, it became apparent that saving it, although it maybe wasn't the best economic move, it was the best move for the birds. Um, so what we've, what we've done is it's literally selectively demoed all the way around it. We left uh, a couple of pieces of steel holding it in place right now. Uh, and then we had a, uh, an analysis done of the chimney itself and it's about three quarters thick of brick uh, with some terracotta tile in it too. Um, and it was actually determined that the chimney has pretty much the ability to stand on its own when we cut it off of the building. And then to make sure that once it's it's attached to our new building, we actually have, we're attaching about the bottom 18 feet of the chimney to the new building and actually, uh, and then going, going below grade two and attaching it to the foundation of the building. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the sequence of the build is, is cut away, stabilize, and then reattach. So if, if you watch the site over the next couple of weeks, we're actually gonna be removing all of the foundations that are there so you're going to have a, a really bare chimney sitting there in about two weeks or so. Uh, hopefully within a, a month or two after that, we'll have the new foundations in and then the building starts to go vertical. So hopefully we have it significantly attached within about three months. Uh, and then we, we've got a chimney that can be used for the migratory birds uh, at the end of the year. That's the goal. Great, thank you. That catches us up with our questions from our YouTube audience. 
I have a question for, oh, can I ask a question? I have a question for Peter and Scott. Um, you know, as, as we're awaiting the return of the birds from South America, and there are a few in the sky, but they're not really back yet. Um, like when they're building their nest, are they, I, I'm curious to see whether birds build a nest in Mr. Noble's Masonic temple chimney. Are they doing that activity all day long in and out of the chimney with twigs? I'll take that one. Uh, yes, um, they construct a nest made of tiny twigs, like two inches long. Um, now, keep in mind, they cannot land on the ground or on a branch to pick these things up. So what they have to do is fly towards the end of a branch, pick a little twig that they like and nip at it and then fly by and come back around and nip at it again and again and again and again until this one little twig breaks off. Then they have to circle back and catch it in midair or they lost it. Each nest is composed of approximately 265 twigs. So imagine the amount of passes each bird has to make just to construct one nest. The nest twigs are held together with the bird's saliva, which during the breeding period, uh, their saliva thickens into a gluey consistency because of the hormone buildup. And so they work on that nest. They perch with one foot on the side of the chimney. They've got the twig in their other foot and they're slathering their saliva on it and then place in place with their bill. So um, it's a real kind of a work of art. Um, if, you, if you've never seen one, uh, try to get to one of my programs because I show the na actual nest. It's really bizarre uh, how they do it. And uh, the fact that it sticks to the wall of the chimney at all is a miracle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, they work on that pretty much most of the day uh, other than feeding and drinking. Um, and then once it becomes dusk, they have to go in and perch and hang for the night and sleep. So uh, the nest probably takes them a couple of weeks to build. And then they'll lay eggs, uh, average four to five eggs. And those will hatch and be ready to leave the nest about mid-July. One brood per year for chimney soil. So it makes sense um, because they're such acrobatic birds, how they're able to do that. I mean, they must constantly been be exercising that capacity <laughs> and building the nest. Um, well, if it weren't for their flight uh, abilities, there's no way they could do this kind of a nest build. And on a vertical surface, it would be incredibly difficult to construct any other type of nest. So they've really evolved a niche. Uh, where they specialize in this nest building and uh, utilization of these vertical surfaces. Is there anything, Scott, that, um, that can be done? I, I guess I have two sets of questions. Like, is there anything that be, can be done that can make it easier for them to be able to construct these nests? And well, then, oh, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, one of the things that they look for is a rough surface on the inside of the chamber that they're working in. Like I said, if they have steel flues, stainless steel flues, like a lot of the new home construction uses, mm -hmm. they can't cling to that. They can't apply their saliva to that and make it stick. It's just too, it's just too uh, smooth for them to get a, a grip on. So they look for older chimneys, these brick chimneys with mortar joints that stick out a little bit, give them places to cling to, and then also attach these uh, saliva laden twigs. So if you were to find some sort of topical surface that could go inside one of the newer chimney chimneys and, and put it on it as um, something they could get more of a, there would be more of a grip as sort of like an opportunity when people are building new homes or something, do you think that they would find those? Um, building codes have a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, you know,
municipalities require stainless steel flues in new home construction. Mm -hmm. So you can't really get away from that. Um, if you put like a, a faux brick surface inside your steel chimney, you've uh, done away with the reason for the steel chimney in the first place, I think. Okay. So it's, it would be hard, if not impossible, to cross over one type of chimney into another. Mm -hmm. When we build our artificial towers, we use uh, wooden interiors with grooves, horizontal grooves cut in the, the panels um, to give the birds a place to purchase on. We do have a couple more questions for, for Mr. Noble, if you would uh, be willing to spend a little more of your time with us. Um, there's a question here from uh, Jenny Deeb, and she just asks, how has the situation with the Chimney Swifts changed your outlook on development in general, or has it? Um, so actually, it hasn't changed my outlook per se. Um, it's been interesting listening to Pete that he hasn't gotten a little bit more positive feedback from some other developers. Um, you know, I, I guess it, it's made me more acutely aware of possibly the lack of some environmental planning in some of these developments that occur. Uh, currently, there's some pretty big developments going on in Bethlehem. And uh, I'm not saying they should change them all, but there, there should definitely be an awareness of environmental impact and how to take the sites that that maybe are are under natural uh, features right now and, and bring them back a little bit with, within the economics of doing buildings and everything else that you need to do so that you can actually develop a site. So it hasn't changed it, but it's, it's maybe been more enlightening on what's going on. Thank you. Um, well, another question here from Mark is, um, I'll just read it. Considering the outstanding effort the Swifts accomplish in building their nests, what are the three most important outstanding efforts our panel would like to see happen in local development? So if you had to name three things. Who's that question for, Josh? Um, I think it's just for the group. In general? Yeah. I think Scott might be the one to answer that as far as the, as far as the benefit for Swifts. Um, you know, the municipal codes, uh, building codes, uh, kind of require some of the things that aren't really the best for Swift. Um, you know, maybe one of the ways to approach this possibly and wouldn't fully solve the problem is to um, make some specialized ordinances, some, some uh, exceptions to rules in buildings that have known swift roosts. Um, for instance, um, you know, if a chimney is going to be uh, redone and lined with a stainless steel flue, if there's a swift roost in there, then, you know, it should maybe be uh, made more difficult and or, you know, illegal to do that. Uh, remember, these birds are federally protected. Disturbance of their roost or nest sites is illegal, federally, federally illegal. Now, this is all um, under the jurisdiction of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and they historically do not prosecute these kind of things because they're undermanned and, and underfunded. So um, to use legal action against this is tough. Um, it's more of a, uh, in, especially like in Mr. Noble's situation, it's a, it's a matter of good faith. Um, realizing the benefits, being the good guy, and doing the right thing. So are you saying that the, the zoning code could actually be in conflict with federal laws? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm talking about where chimneys are being um, torn down that have existing roosts in them. If these roosts are known about, then they're in conflict with federal law. Um, the building codes themselves aren't in necessarily conflict with that, but disturbing the roost and nesting sites of the birds certainly is in conflict with the way. Well, one thing I'll add is it's only in conflict with federal law when they're actually active. So if there's a nest with young or eggs, or if there's thousands of birds in the chimney and it's 
torn down while they're there using it, that's an offense. During the off season, you can do what you want to a chimney. And um, that's something where education comes in and timing of doing any type of demolition or changing of a structure. It's a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. It is. Karen, did you want to jump in on here in this? Well, one thing I wanted to add um, as far as, you know, actions to possibly take is the, the work that we're hoping to do over the summer with some students um, from Lehigh. Um, in addition to, you know, reaching out to the development community to figure out how, you know, their work can um, collaborate with the conservation work we're talking about tonight. We're going to have students from Lehigh University spending time this summer working closely um, with the Lehigh Valley Audubon Society to go out and identify where these um, roosts and sites are. Um, and then hopefully, you know, not hopefully, once they've compiled that information, we're gonna get that onto a map so we can look at throughout the city sort of where these sites are relative to one another. Um, and what that can do for us too is highlight opportunities to sort of fill in any existing gaps in where there may be spaces for these birds to use. Um, and as I was mentioning before, these spaces don't need to be huge. Emma's already volunteered her school, which I think is a great idea. We'll see if we can do something along those lines. Um, but also other public public areas or other, you know, properties looking to collaborate on these kinds of efforts. It points out sort of where more space can be made for the birds. Um, and so just other, you know, in addition to collaboration with developers as we're building new or, or demol demolishing and replacing or doing significant rehab jobs on on various pieces of property, just to sort of map out where there could be more space, where we could make more space um, for the birds could also be very valuable. Uh, in relation to that, and Karen knows about this, um, Lehigh Valley Audubon and Wincote Audubon uh, in cooperation have started uh, Chimney Swift registry in the state of Pennsylvania where we are trying to catalog all the known nesting and roosting sites that we can. Uh, this gives us a database on uh, things like uh, pointing out to developers where potential problems might arise or uh, replacing chimneys that do come down with artificial nesting structures, roosting structures. Um, there's a specific website we have for that to report any uh, chimney swift uh, nesting or roosting chambers uh, I do not have that website handy right now, but if you contact uh, us at lvaudubon.org, someone can get you that uh, information for sure. And, and you know, we put a link to it on the bottom of the library Save Our Swifts page. So it's bapl.org slash Save Our Swifts. I pasted it in the chat. So okay, great. people yeah, can scroll to the bottom, click the bird and uh, report what they've seen. Rena, can I um, ask Mr. Noble, um, I'm gonna put you on the spot, John. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm not sorry. <laughs> you, Cause I know you're gonna respond well. Um, so, I mean, it's so encouraging as you can see uh, to um, Peter and Scott to hear you talk. So I'm just wondering how, like if, if there's a real way that we can get you uh, I don't, I'm, I'm thinking of a coalition of developers who are willing to consider and just getting developers and environmentalists together to, to talk about the possibilities. Can you imagine such a, such a thing, such a gathering, an educational, optional, you know, encouraging thing? <laughs> so, so that was what I wanted to just say real quick. Um, so when you originally approached me, okay, I was kind of focused on, on just the fact that we had, a, we had a chimney that was being used by a lot of birds and it really needed to be safe. Um, at the end of the day, what's, what's coming out of this whole thing though, um, is it's actually a, a PR win beyond your wildest dreams. Yes. I've got nothing but great feedback from everyone. Um, we're kind of folding the whole Swift thing into a business model. Mm -hmm. it, we actually believe that at the end of the day, the, the chimney is kind of going to be a, a little bit of a driver to the site. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're talking to developers or, or, or businessmen or businesswomen, whatever, you know, 
it, it always kind of comes down to a business model, but it's very, it's very tough to measure it. But I really believe with the amount of feedback I'm getting right now, that the business model will ultimately be a, a win for this type of project. And this type of project can be translated to literally anything that you save environmentally, because the one thing that's going to come out of this, this pandemic environment is that I believe everyone is reassessing their environment. They want to go out, they want to eat outside, they want to walk in nature, they want to bike, they want to do all of these things that really need to become part of any, any good conscious modern development. And there's, it's just a win. It's win for everyone in the community. It's win for nature. And it has a tendency to have a little bit of an economic benefit for the actual developer. Yes. If you look at it. So, That's so cool. it's better not to pave the entire surface. It's better to think of the, of the bigger picture because at the end of the day, you know, it's better for the community and it's, it's better economically. That's, that's the one amazing thing that's come out of this for me. Yeah. That's I was, was going to make a green site anyways. That was just what I wanted to do. Uh, that's just me. Uh, the birds have been a real bonus. And, and the way we're going to ultimately uh, take advantage of them is to educate people. And I really think it'll probably help drive to the site. You know? Yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. Mm. So sort of people could actually conceivably be sitting outside at a restaurant eating dinner at night, watching these birds fly in the chimney. And that was one of the first things I asked Scott about. I asked him um, where they went to the bathroom and it was not where they nested. <laughs> so safely do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So... Um, are there more questions from the public or should we have our own our own more questions, Josh? I do not see any more questions in the chat at the moment. Okay. We have a little bit more time. Sure, as long as you want. <laughs> Rena, can I bring up a, a, one more project that's in the works just um, to, to pique people's interest? So there's the, the internship that's happening this summer that both Brina and Karen are uh, mentoring, as well as the Lehigh Valley Audubon Society. I'm also cooking up a, um, a project for next year's fourth grade class. Emma, if you want to repeat fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it, but. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get two poets into my classroom, one of whom is going to be bilingual. The two poets are Cleveland Wall and Norberto D Dominguez, and as well as possibly some Lehigh University student poets who are bilingual. They're gonna teach the kids about poetry writing. We're gonna learn about the Swifts. The kids are gonna write poetry about the Swifts. And we're going to, um, we're, we're forming a relationship right now with a school down in Peru and a school down in Bolivia. And we are going to exchange information about the Swifts in their in the two ends of their migration, with with you know between the classes, and we're, then we're going to end with a um, bilingual poetry reading, inspired by the Swifts. <laughs> so awesome. I'm really excited about this. We don't quite have the funding all lined up yet, but you know what? We're going ahead anyways. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, it's exciting. So on the, the Lehigh student um, internship front that Dr. Pooley and I are working on, um, we have a, some students are, are interested in sort of building some of these towers that Scott Burnett has been working on. Um, the, the alternative to the actual chimney, the recreation of a, a um, different kind of chimney that's uh, not actually attached to a fireplace, I guess. And so um, we hope to have students kind of figuring out how to do that best. And we're also interested in considering like what can be done locally through education, and through ordinances to encourage people who have active roosts to not, I guess, cap them. This is what I understand it to be that some people cap their chimneys if they're no longer in use. Um, so trying to figure out what can be done with that. And then also, how, what are the best places, as Dr. Pulley was saying, to put new towers? Um, I can't help, every time I think about what I learned tonight about the, that the 
speed of turnover in the use of the huge chimney on Mr. Noble's property. I, I just like gasp for, for air when I think about what would have happened if it disappeared. Like where would those tens of thousands or 10,000 birds have gone? And it really makes me think that, that we, it would be fantastic if we could get more towers and more locations available in case there's more situations where we don't have developers who are so willing to accommodate. I don't know if um, Scott or Peter want to talk at all about that. Um, well, the big towers, if you tear them down, you're going to probably lose thousands of swifts to the environment because they can't readily find another location during their mass migration, especially in the fall. During the summer, it's not going to make much difference. And the small towers that we, or Scott's building, they're only used by one pair or a few dozen swifts um, during migration um, for roosting. It's a smaller impact. Um, but the big industrial chimneys like the Masonic Temple are critical because these birds are very site specific. And if they, there isn't another unoccupied usable chimney in the very close proximity, these birds will not find it during migration and will end up on the outside of a building or on a tree. And if it's bad weather like it is tonight, it's snowing at my house right now, um, they would die. So this is real, the, it's the fall migration and is the critical time for mass numbers. Okay. So. One, of our, one of our questions um, just now asked, if there's anything that can be done to draw the Swiss to a vacant chimney. Uh, not really. Um, but if the vacant chimney is in an urban area, it's far more likely to get uh, swift usage than if it's in the middle of the country side somewhere. There really are urban birds they've taken to cities just because of the number of chimneys that are available there. Mm -hmm. So as chimneys go down, as chimneys get capped, what do the birds do? We mm -hmm. don't know. Well, we have lots and lots of work to do on this project, I feel like, that has been outlined tonight um, for the future. And um, I'm so, uh, we usually go to um, half past, is that right, um, to 8.30 in these conversations? Approximately, I think. Yeah, okay. I have a hard out, but that's a, that sounds good to me. Yep, that's, okay. it's, we're flexible. Okay, so um, I guess I would just want to wonder if um, anybody at all wants to sort of reflect, put on your reflective hat um, a little bit for some questions that I often hear um, Jenny mentioning, um, but um, sort of that are maybe a little bit more philosophical. If anybody wants to reflect on those, I was just going to um, suggest a couple before we close. Um, First was, you know, how might the symbolic gesture of naming the chimney swift bird of Bethlehem impact our relationship to the species? You know, how do we envision this, this playing out in our city? Um, will, will just the fact that it's the bird of Bethlehem, you know, inspire greater conservation of the bird? Wonder if you all think of that, or if you can think of examples or something like that, um, where there's this intention by a people to protect one particular species, um, something that will give it a, a lot more attention and care from the public. Um, I see Emma's hand on that one. Yeah, Emma wants okay. to speak. <laughs> Great. You gotta unmute yourself then, Emma. Okay, so um, I think that people will help the chimney swift more since it's the bird of Bethlehem because um they know that it's like endangered if it like is the bird of Bethlehem and they want to try and save it. That's great. So just that attention makes a difference in how people think about it by educating them that it that it's threatened. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's, it's symbolic. 
Yeah. You know, it means something. Uh, even though it gains no physical protection by having that d distinction, it's symbolic. It, it lets people know that the birds are there. They're important. They deserve respect and attention. Uh, and uh, you don't name a city bird if it's, you know, a starling, I don't think. But, uh, you know, these birds have a benefit. They're part of our community. Uh, we're the reason they are, and we're the reason they're imperiled. So the least we can do is respect them and give them a chance. And I, I think by being a city bird, now the city has stated their commitment that if um, your research this summer identifies public property and city parks for a tower, the city would be you know, willing and committed to help, help those be built. Um, they can certainly use it in maybe some of their marketing for the city, and that just all helps with the education as well. I'd just like to speak briefly on these towers we speak of. Uh, about a dozen years ago, Peter and I got to talking, and uh, he showed me this book, this little paperback book, and it was something to the effect of... Uh, you know, helping America's misunderstood bird. And it was a little guide as to how to, um, that, there Jenny has it, um, how to create alternative habitat for these birds uh, other than existing chimneys and so forth. And this couple in Texas started experimenting with these artificial chimneys that they built. And Peter and I kind of, it was just a, a glimmer in our eye at that time, but uh, I decided to try it. And uh, I built one on the side of my garage at my house and uh, it failed. And so I went to the Allentown Parks Department. And I said, hey, you guys have lots of land. Can I put up some of these units, you know, as housing for Swifts and Fortunately, the parks the people were very receptive to the idea. And I built another one, according to the book. And it failed. And I was being yet discouraged. So then I modified the plan, thinking these people are in Texas. We're much farther north. Uh, conditions are a little bit different here during nesting season, et cetera. I modified it. And my third one was a success. We had birds nesting in it within six weeks of it being completed. So it works. It does work. Like Peter said, it's probably only going to be used as a nesting chamber. Um, and maybe by a few dozen, 50 uh, birds during migration in fall. But every swift chick that we fledge reduces that average mortality of 72% since the 1960s. We can't, we can't ever boost the swift population if we don't start producing more y'all, more offspring. Mm -hmm. So that is the big draw of these artificial towers that we're building. And they're, if, if a person has any kind of uh, mechan mechanical ability at all, you could build one. Um, we have Eagle Scouts building them as Eagle Scout projects. Uh, I've consulted on dozens of these things for like uh, EACs, um, you know, environmental centers, all different places that they want to build it themselves, but they just need a little help how to do it. Well, that's where I come in, you know, and I would highly recommend anyone that's even thinking about putting up a tower uh, obtains that book that Jenny was showing. It's available at chimneyswifts.org little paperback. I think it's about 13 or $14. It's a real help in uh, getting started in, uh, you know, the effort to produce these artificial chimneys, which will help with the population increase of Swifts. Small at first, but the more we put up, the more it will help. Will you, will you tell us? Oh, I'm sorry. I had, to, I had to say it's also available at the library. Sorry. Oh, okay. I, I get excited about that. <laughs> we, ordered a, we ordered a couple of copies for our Swift, um, si our, our city. So come to, you can borrow them at the library. We have that one. There's another similar title about uh, protecting Swift. So we have those at the library. Sorry to, sorry to jump in. 
I hope that no, you. That's good. And I wanted to point out something was, was since Scott pointed out the beginning of our venture down the chimney swift towers to John Noble, um, a positive. I approached the James Hardy Corporation for their Hart, Hardy board siding. I had a commercial dealing with them and knew about their products. And I asked them for one damaged bundle of their siding for the chimney swift towers because they don't require any maintenance once they're put up. And they ended up sending a tractor trailer flatbed load of Scott, how many was it? Seven bundles? Seven or eight bundles. That um, you needed a forklift to get them off the trailer. Yeah, each bundle required an industrial forklift unloaded. We had enough to do houses, let alone a few chimney swift towers. So if you can use J uh, James Hardy products in your developments, um, they built so many chimney swift towers in the tri-state area that Scott reached out because I'm like, okay, I got this stuff for free. And it reminded me of what my mother told me, be careful what you wish for. Because I asked for one bundle and I got hundreds of bundles of this product and enough to do, like I said, houses, let alone chimney swift towers. That is a really funny story. Yeah. I'm glad to know who to support when I build something. Um, our, our local EAC, we were choking on this stuff and it was actually in the way of a, a business that was storing it for us. They had a fire and had to get rid of it. So we sold it and transformed it into Purple Martin Towers. So, I mean, it's just a gift that kept giving. It's been incredible. Did that siding have something to do with how Scott changed the design to make it attractive? No, no, he just increased the size and the entrance. Um, the siding really is just a protectant to protect the wood underneath. Okay. And um, it's fireproof, relatively vandal proof. You can scratch it and the colors all through it. It's recycled um, cardboard into a concrete slurry that's made into boards. Hmm. So it's, it's a really, it's recycling and um, maintenance free. Fantastic. I have one more question here from the, from the group. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, uh, Peter said, uh, he's asking if we, would we be better served to build towers that could serve larger numbers of shifts or to focus on finding a way to use the existing chimneys in say buildings like uh, at the hospital that no longer use them for heating. Uh, is there something, some efforts that can be done to, to reuse those or is, it, uh, is that not an option and it's better to, to build? Oh, no. well, I think the large industrial ones are incredibly important for fall migration. I mean, they're, they are a critical migratory stop off for all of these swifts. So any one of those we can um, save is probably, and Scott can agree or disagree with me on this, is a thousand times more useful than building individual towers that may and may not be used. The I small agree. ones will only bring a brood a year, usually out of them, where you can save tens of thousands in migration by saving the big ones. I would uh, add that these birds have a relatively short lifespan. I think the oldest swift uh, that was ever banded and recaptured was seven years old. So they don't live a long time. They have to mature quickly in their first year, reproduce, reproduce. And when their mate dies, they have to quickly find another one. And there's a lot of uh, weak links in the chain there. So anywhere we can help uh, roosting colonies communally in the fall and uh, breeding um, pairs in the spring, um, it's a two-edged sword that we have to uh, go at this with. Um, uh, I would um, definitely agree with Peter that these large existing chimneys 
especially, you know, the old masonry chimneys, like on churches and schools and uh, factories are the critical ones. These are the ones that hold thousands of birds. There's a chimney at Reading High School. Uh, it's one of the largest in the state. It averages 14,000 swifts a night in it. So that's a lot of birds. And the one that chimney the came down, spot. the swifts would be sad. I... And the chimney behind the hospital, Scott. Uh, yeah, the at Rob Middle School. Yeah, uh, okay. right up the street for me. Rob Middle School has a huge chimney. It gets probably 3,000 birds a night in it. And, you know, I've been reading more and more on this since it started. Steel Stacks um, is wide open with probably lots of ledges in it. And that could be a huge migratory stopover spot as well. As long as the interiors of these vertical chambers, and they must be nearly vertical for the Swifts to be attracted to them, as long as there's enough uh, rough edges in there for them to get a grip on their adequate roosting and nesting sites. So yeah, steel stacks would be, a, you know, Bethlehem just uh, came up so quickly as an industrial powerhouse mm -hmm. with the steel and everything else. Yeah. So many masonry chimneys sprung mm -hmm. up within 50 yeah. years that it was a natural spot for the Swifts to really colonize heavily. So, you know, seeing these things going away due to whether it's age or development or whatever, um, you know, it pains me to see them go away because Bethlehem is such a stronghold for the Swifts. There's a very large um, Mason Tower behind St. Luke's Hospital on the south side. I'm wondering um, whether it's a roost. So that's something for the students to look at. Yep, as long there. as it's not capped, it probably has Swifts using it. There's also a huge tower on the north side, um, the Laros, the old Laros building um, on Broad Street is another one to take a look at. What you need to do is go out in fall, early evenings and take up a vigil at one of these big chimneys and just watch it for a night or two. And you'll know right away if at dusk they'll start circling around that chimney in ever tighter uh, vortex of swifts and you'll know that they're there immediately yeah i i try to always encourage more swift watches mm. for people to go out and see these birds because then they can you know form their own opinion and and you know usually it's a good opinion that they form of these birds yeah at muhlenberg college we have a relatively small chimney that's not used anymore and I don't know what you documented at that one, Scott, but it was hundreds, right? Hundreds, like 500 there. And it's yeah. only a two foot square chimney. It's small and it's, <laughs> it's not very tall either. So, I mean, any, any chimney with an interior of more than 10 inches square is fair game for these birds. There's no, about... sorry, go ahead, Josh. Uh, it's a question from the group. What about the blast furnished chimneys uh, over there at I said, are those, uh, Attractive to the Swifts or can something like be done? Said, as long them? as they're vertical chim chambers and they have enough of a rough surface on the inside for the birds to uh, get their claws on and hold on to, yeah, they're fair game for, for Swifts. Could something be done to make them more attractive to the Swifts? I suppose it could, but it wouldn't be very cost effective. It would be hugely expensive. I mean, those, they, I don't think they've been um, rehabilitated yet, have they? Like the insides, they haven't been no, cleaned? Yeah. Maybe. But it, it, it does make me wonder, like, what's, has anyone ever thought about actually recreating a massive chimney instead of doing the smaller roofs? It's like, there's a lot of yeah. engineers that, you know, yeah. if you found the right it's, spot. Um, John's a great example of someone who was willing to build a large chimney for them. Uh, fortunately, he was able to save the existing chimney and we didn't have to go down that rabbit hole. But uh. so, so just to, to get a little bit, I, I call quite a number of Audubon societies across the country that actually have built larger chimneys mm -hmm. and almost to a single one, they have not worked well at all. Even when they were replacing chimneys that, that had a good uh, roost potential, um, it, it just it just wasn't a good outcome, which kind of made the saving this chimney that much more important. 
Yeah, when I met with John the first time over on the site, uh, you know, again, my job was to uh, enlighten him about what the Swifts are, what they do, what they need, and then to present him with just some options that he could think about. And I was shocked when, with no hesitation, he said, well, no matter what, we're going to save the habitat for these birds here, no matter what it takes. And I wept. Hmm. Yeah, it was, it was that emotional to me. Hmm. He's, the, he's the only one. Thank you, John. It's really inspiring, um, all of your dedication to this issue and to protecting these birds is inspiring. I think there's many of us who don't look up into the sky <laughs> and think about the life that's going on up there. Um, so unless there's more questions, I feel like we should bring it to a close. And um, I, I wanna thank everybody for your great contributions to the panel and for all the work that you're doing. And um, I hope, I thank the audience as well for their wonderful questions. And I hope that we continue to generate public support around this. And um, I'm already thinking of citizen science projects to help figure out where these chimneys are and try to get them protected. So we just need an, we need an uh, Save Our Swiss SOS app so people can see them, take a picture and upload it to a map on the spot. We already have a beta version of that. Excellent. Being developed, yeah. Yeah. It's a Swift reporting app. So Brady, great. Can, can, we, can we possibly talk about, uh, this is off camera, but uh, getting <laughs> incorporating some real-time video of some of these places? Because if people can actually see these birds in action, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Especially if they know that, that that's a local camera feed you're dealing with, you know, not something across the across the country. It's, it's something literally that's going on in Bethlehem. We'll host it on the library site. We have a all offer our live feed site. <laughs> so we're doing that at your place, John. Oh yeah. I, I, I we're can't doing wait that to with get you. that running. So you're talking about trying to figure out a way, John, to when we find the roosts, especially the big roosts, where you get to see the thousands of them all flying together in interesting ways. Um, you're wanting to sort of see if we can figure out how to uh, record that and get it online. It'd be nice to see a, a roost in action and also a nesting pair, if that's possible. And, and I know Pete's done a, a fair bit of research on the cameras because they are sensitive to certain lights. Mm -hmm. So there's specific cameras that, that work in these environments. Mm -hmm. I just, if we can, if, I know we're going to try to get it once once we go live with our website. We'll have we'll have some sort of live feed with mm -hmm. our tower. It's great. I have very close up access to nesting pairs that shows them, you know, feeding the chicks, incubating the eggs, the chicks moving out of the nest, testing their wings, all that stuff. I can provide video of that. I don't know about a live stream. Well, uh, yeah, feed, uh, some, but, something about a live stream would just show people in yeah, depth that it is happening, you know, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, it just makes me think about some of the stuff that Karen has done in her classes with students about like just trying to make the what the, the what's going on around you more visible to people, you know, through visual maps and visual signs and visual references. And it, I, I love the idea. And I suspect that that her students who are often very clever and thinking about these things could come up with some great ideas for how to integrate that into the city. Um, assuming we can, like maybe, I love the hospital idea because I can imagine that as an institution that might let us do something like that um, to put a camera up or um, otherwise to, you know, inside or something as well and incorporate it, in it into maps and tours. And it fits so well within everything that's the historic preservation that's going on in the city and the, the draw that we already have for tourists, so to come here and see, can see historic Bethlehem. All right, so now we have gone over our time limit. Does anyone have any any final comments they would like to make before we close? I don't, have we lost our audience yet, Josh? No, they're hanging <laughs> in. Some of them might be, uh, you know, 
Okay, any, any final yeah. questions from the audience um, that anyone has that, and, or for our panelists before we let them go? Just, thank, just notes of thanks. There's just notes of thank you from the, from the attendees. Um, and my uh, <laughs> not very large announcement, but we have these neat Save Our Swift stickers to give out at the library. So um, stop in at the front desk and anyone who's in the audience can come pick one up and uh, spread the word. Great. I think we should let uh, Emma say a few words in closing. <laughs> She's still awake? You didn't put her to sleep? <laughs> what do you want to say at the end about the Swift? Um, so I think that um, we should um, talk more about like building the Swift Towers in like big fields so then like if they come to roost in the towers, um, they can um, go into the towers that they see in the big fields. Good idea. Very good. We're on it, Emma. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, everyone. Great to see you all. Thanks for the good conversation. Thank, thank you. Bye. Again, thank you for having me. Oh, all thank right. you, Emma. <laughs> You're a star. You're the best. <laughs> Go Swift. Go Swift. Go Swift. Swift cheerleaders. Go swiftly. <laughs> Go swiftly. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started on that. No, don't get me started. Don't get me started.